Good morning, New Day. Let's stand and praise the Lord. It's always a pleasure and a blessing to be with all of you. Uh, despite of how, how our week went and how next week is going to go, God is still faithful. Amen. And so we're so thankful that we have all of you to share um, in this life that God has for each and every one of us. I know that we all have different walks in life, but so did the disciples. Did you know that? We had a, a tax collector. We had one who was very loving. Then we had one who was very opinionated. <laughs> we had one who was a zealot. 
and then we, were, we had one who was employed by Rome. What does that mean? It means that all of God's people, as long as we have Christ at the very center of all that we do, we can make it work for his glory and for our good. Just look at the disciples. God used them in such wonderful ways for the glory of God and for the glory of the kingdom. Well, with that being said, I just want to welcome all of you. If you're a, a guest here, uh, please plan to stay behind and let us talk to you, get to know you. We always say we want to make you family, but we can't make you family if we don't know who you are. Uh, we do have a few people out, so let's just remember them in prayer and in our thoughts and in, in our hearts. And so with that being said, let's go to our Lord in prayer as we honor him and ask for his leadership this morning. And almighty God and Father, we, we thank you just for who you are. Lord, the very worst thing we could ever do is put conditions on our relationship. Lord, let us just be faithful just as you are faithful. Lord, so many times we, we seek your hands and not seek your face. So many times, Lord, we, we look at our wants when you're taking care of our needs. So, Lord, we just focus on you alone. And we thank you for all that you are and all that we have in you. Thank you, Lord, for the breath in our lungs. Thank you, Lord, for the shelter that you provide. Thank you, Lord, for the nourishment that you provide. Lord, every good and perfect gift is because of you. So, Lord, we, we thank you for, for those who are here today because they're healthy to be here. But also we thank you for those who are hurting and sick at home who are also here with us in spirit. Lord, we pray for their healing as well. But most of all, Lord, we want to come today into your house on your day, Lord, to simply worship you in spirit and in truth. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us, Lord, would be open to the word that you give us to hear today. Lord, that we would open our hearts in our spirits, Lord, as we worship you. Lord, that we would begin just to trust you because you are God. And so, Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us and the freedom that we have to worship you. And dear God, we pray that you would get all the glory, honor, and praise that is due your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
We thank you, Father, for today. Not just the moments that are good or just the moments that are easy. Lord, there's a lot that led up in people's lives. A lot of ups and downs, victories, losses. We just give them all to you, God. I'm so thankful that we have a God like you who loves us like you do. You don't leave us on our own to just figure things out. You don't abandon us. You don't forsake us. You're calling us day after day, minute after minute. And when we fall down, you encourage us to get back up and keep moving. So Lord, whatever we brought with us today, maybe you were bringing a sacrifice of praise, of joy and of love, and we come and we want to lay it at your feet and say thank you. Maybe some of us are bringing a gift of pain, a gift of hardship, a gift of heartache. But it's all we got. We know you don't turn that away. Because we are here for you, Jesus. This is your time. You are the one who is the Savior. So we want to hear from your spirit and from your word that we make much of you, Jesus. Help your servant to decrease so that you may increase. Speak to us, God. Encourage our hearts. Lift our spirits. Lift our minds so that when we leave here today, we leave refreshed. Not because some human brought a word, not because some human did something. They don't need me. They need you, Father. That we would be refreshed by the spirit of the living God. For you are on the throne. You reign. And in that we find our hope. So we thank you, Lord. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. You all may be seated. It's wonderful to worship with everybody this morning. We're continuing our, our walk through the life of David and through the life of Saul. This will be our last week in this, in this series. Next week is the 11th, and it'll be kind of a special day. It'll be family service. But the goal will be to bless our children and all the folks going into school. So college students, that's you too. All right, You need to be blessed going into college. So that's going to be our focus next weekend is for us to pray and bless and have an encouragement going into the school year. Um, also, if you want to help with school supplies with any of our students or any of our folks, you can sign up at the back table there. But that's where we're headed. After that, we're going to go through the I Am Statements of Jesus so that we can get a good grasp of who he is and what he does for us. But if you would open up your Bibles, phones, tablets, whatever you're comfortable using, to 1 Samuel chapter 31. 1 Samuel 31, verse, we're going to be in verses 1 through 7. And this is the culmination of the book of 1 Samuel. Right? We're seeing the lives of David and Saul run their course. Just to give you a reminder of how we got here, King Saul was elected as a young man, as a Benjamite said he was head and shoulders taller than everyone in Israel. He was handsome because the Israelites wanted a king. They didn't want a judge anymore. In other words, they didn't want God to be their king. They wanted a man because all the other kingdoms had one, so they gave them Saul. Saul started out just fine, but very quickly he disobeyed God, and he disobeyed God. And his heart was unrepentant. One of the things we see in the life of Saul Saul did not ever seek to make his relationship with God right. He sought to be out of the consequences of his sin. So then we get introduced to David, a shepherd boy. And this is important to the story because Samuel, the prophet, goes out to Jesse, the father, and he says, give me all your sons. And David was not even found worthy enough to be brought before Samuel. He was a nobody even in his own family. They had to go gather him. Because Jesse basically said, there's no way you would want somebody like David. And that's who gets anointed to be the next king. David then goes and he slays Goliath and he fights Philistines. He does all these great things. And he wants to be in the family of Saul. Because after killing Goliath, he was supposed to be betrothed to Saul's, one of Saul's daughters. And in that course, he becomes best friends with Jonathan, the eldest son of Saul. And they were intertwined. Right? God, they love one another, but they both were following God. Saul followed himself. He tried to kill David, 
tried to kill his own son, Jonathan. He began to chase it. He did heinous acts all throughout this. Samuel dies, and he doesn't turn to the Lord. He turns to Samuel, and he goes to see a witch. And that witch tells him that we get to this point in the story. He and his sons will be where Samuel is. So this is the culmination. This is where all the acts have led. So if you'll read with me. Now the Philistines were fighting against Israel. And the men of Israel fled before the Philistines, and they fell slain on Mount Gilboa. And the Philistines overtook Saul and his sons. The Philistines struck down Jonathan, Abinadab, Malchishua, and the sons of Saul. The battle pressed hard against Saul. The archers found him. He was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and thrust it through me, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword, and he fell upon it. And when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell upon his sword and died with him. Thus Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor bearer, and all his men on that same day together. When the men of Israel were on the other side of the valley, and those beyond the Jordan saw the men of Israel had fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they abandoned their cities, and they fled. And so the Philistines came to live in them. Unfortunately, when we reach the end of this chapter, and then the end of Saul, it doesn't end on a high note. I would love to say all stories do. We, especially here in the West as Americans, love that comeback story. This is very common for stories in the East, though. Right? When you look at their heroes, it's always tragic and tragedy. Right? We love our victories here. But that doesn't always happen. Not only was he defeated, Israel as a whole was defeated. Their force was defeated because they followed the wrong leader. And it wasn't their fault. They didn't choose to follow the wrong leader, per se. They didn't see Saul as the wrong leader. They only knew to be faithful. But Saul knew. The people who followed Saul knew. And how do we know that this man was the wrong leader? If you remember, when the priest aided David, Saul had every priest killed that, that helped him. Right? So he would go against the people of God every chance he got. So we must be very careful who we put our trust in. Because we may not know. We see a certain thing. We may look at it a certain way. This could be at work. This could be spiritually. This could be in many places. And we're just trying to be faithful. But I must be very cautious who am I put that faith in. Myself as a pastor take this notion very seriously. That's why I communicate the way I do, that this is not my church, this is Jesus' church. Right? I'm not pastor of, of, of a church, I am a pastor in the church. I'm just an under-shepherd to Christ. And we take that notion very seriously. So Saul's end is losing everything. Before he died, he sees his men fleeing. He sees the righteous son Jonathan perish. And Jonathan was a godly man. He was a man of valor. He was a man who would do what is right to the end. And I cannot help but admire Jonathan greatly. He had several choices. Long ago, he could have left Saul and joined David. But that was not his role as the prince. And not just prince of Saul, the prince of Israel. He had a duty to his people. And he was not going to leave them for the easy route. For the route he probably preferred, going off, adventuring with his best friend. If Jonathan was with David, David may not have made the same mistakes he did. He wouldn't have let him. But instead, he was faithful. He could have staged a coup. He could have looked at his father and said, you're crazy and out of your mind. But he did not dare do so because he knew God had called his father to be king. He could have fled. He could have just thrown his hands up and said, forget this. Forget Israel. Forget David. Forget Saul. I'm going to do my own thing. No. 
he was, was going to be faithful to the end. This is why when the witch tells Saul, you and your sons are going to die, even if Saul had told Jonathan, don't go, you'll die on the battlefield, Jonathan would have went. It wouldn't have deterred him. It wouldn't have stopped him. Even if he knew that, I guarantee every time he stepped on the battlefield with his father up to this point, he knew the man he was walking with. But his trust was in God, not in Saul. And folks, sometimes when we're walking with God, we end up in some very hard places. So the call is faithfulness. The call was never to make life easier. Man, I would have loved that. But Jesus says, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. And we see that with Jonathan. So the sons had to pay the sins of their father. And this is why we look into eternity. This seems horribly unfair. Right? Because not just Jonathan dies, Abinadab and Melchashua, they die as well. But there's something to this. David was already anointed to be king. If any of Saul's heirs had survived, David would not be in line to be king. And I'm not saying so God killed these men to make a way for David. I am going to say this. God knew these boys would die being faithful. And he would not live Israel kingless. It has to do with foreknowledge in this point, not predestination. So I want you to hear me on that. God did not kill Jonathan Abinadab, Melchishua. But he knew they would die. And he would not leave Israel kingless. But these were the rightful heirs. Right? Could you imagine had they survived? Jonathan, he would have abdicated the throne. He said, David, it's yours. But I don't know if that's true for his brothers. There may have been a fight. There may have been an, an inward fight. We see this because one of Saul's younger sons who was kind of cast off Ishbosheth fights David for the throne. And David is like, take it. I don't even want to fight you for this, man. Some of the stuff transpires. And Ishbosheth gets assassinated. Not by David. But by people in Saul's army who want to get in good with David. And the man who does this, David has slain. Because David loved God. And because he loved God, he was going to love who God anointed period. So not that this was the only way for David to be king, become king, but this is a way that we know. So Saul is in this horrible spot. He sees his sons, his men, and he gets hit by arrows. He's mortally wounded. Now, it's easy to look at what happens here and be like, hey, he, he committed suicide. That's not really the right view of this, because he didn't, he wasn't hopeless. He wasn't like, hey, I, I can make it. He was going to die. And the choice was either be slain by his people or be captured by the enemy, which would have meant torture and a whole bunch of other horrific stuff. So this was mercy. So he looks at his armor bearer and he says, I need you, I need you to do your I need you to end me. The armor bearer has literally one job, which is to make sure the king doesn't die. Okay? So he's in a real hard place. He's like, I got one job, king, and you are asking me to break it. I can't do it. I'm going to have to be faithful. I can't do this, king. So Saul falls on his own sword. And this is horrifically poetic. This is the final statement of a man who lived for himself. His final statements were not crying out to God. They weren't repenting. They weren't begging God for mercy. There was no joy. Instead, he reaped what he sown. Saul fell on his own sword years ago. This was just the day it ended him. He constantly followed himself. And God would give an opportunity. He rejected it. He rejected it. And then God says, I'm angry with you. And Saul doesn't say, how do I fix it? He goes, oh, okay. Well, I'm just go over here and do my own thing then. Right? If, if we were in a relationship as parents and our kids, and they've done something really, really bad, right, and we jump on them, right, and, and they deserve the discipline, 
None of us would turn our kid away when they walked in and said, I'm sorry. When we say, hey, I'm upset with you, I'm disappointed in you, that doesn't mean I'll never forgive you. It's just the reality. So instead of Saul saying, Father, I'm sorry, he said, okay, cool, I'll do me. My truth will be my truth, my way will be my way, and uh, see you later, God. And then anytime something bad happened, he'd cry out to God, and God's like, I didn't put you here. You did. And eventually he says, you know better. You know better. He turned to wickedness instead of righteousness. Maybe had he turned to God, he, maybe he may not have been spared. Maybe he still would have died in battle. But maybe he wouldn't have been falling on his own sword. So Saul and his sons have perished. We preach about redemption and grace here every Sunday. And that's so important. We say all the time, it is never too late to change your life. But now I have to caveat that. That is not 100% true. When you die, that's it. We have one life. Death is the end as far as Scripture teaches. When we shed this mortal coil without the grace of Jesus, I will be separated from him. I don't know what Saul's salvation is. We can speculate all day long. All I know is this. I don't want to be where he was spiritually when I die. That's something I can change today. I don't have to follow Saul. He is our cautionary tale of being called by God, but still choosing to live wickedly. So our first point is this. It's very simple. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Every minute is a choice. Every minute is between I can serve myself or I can serve God. Every minute is I can serve myself or I can serve my family. Every minute is I can serve myself or I can serve my church. Every minute is I can serve myself or I can serve a stranger. Every minute is a choice between do I do what God's asked of me or do I serve me? How often do I want to be on the throne of my life and let Jesus stay on the cross? I love the idea that he died for me and that he shed his blood for me. But it can be very difficult to realize he didn't just do that. He's also Lord of my life. I'm the one that needs to be on the cross and he needs to be on the throne of my life. That's the choice we're in every day, every moment. And here's the thing. The ultimate call of the devil is for us to worship him. But if he can't get us to worship him, he'll settle for you worshiping anything other than God. But a really sweet spot is he gets us to worship ourselves. He gets us to worship ourselves. So if you're saying, well, how do I worship God? What is worship? Join us in our missional communities. That's the topic of this next section. We're going to spend six weeks talking about worship from a biblical perspective. What does it look like to worship God? We have two groups meeting. It is not too late. It's not even too late to host. Well, I would highly encourage everybody to find a group to participate in. But we'll move on. So the Philistines gain this ground because everybody flees. Everybody flees. They see Saul and his sons gone. The hope of Israel, it's over. But folks, this is why we have to serve not an earthly king, but a spiritual one. I don't have to worry about fleeing because I don't serve a king who could be deposed. I don't have to worry about this because I don't serve a king who fails. I don't serve a king who falls short. I serve the king of kings. And I must never forget this because we live in a very polarized political world with lots of political statements. My political statement is very, very simple. It is Christ and Christ crucified. For without him, I would be dead in my trespasses. I don't care what color or what animal, they haven't done squat for me in my eternity. I serve a king who is holy, so a king who is good. And I need not be afraid, because he is my Lord, period. So let's see what happens. This is 1 Samuel 31, 8 through 13. The next day the Philistines came and they stripped the slain. They found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. So they cut off his head and they stripped him of his armor. They sent messengers throughout the land of the Philistines to carry the good news to the houses of their idols and to their people. They put his armor in the temple of Ashtaroth, 
They fastened his body in the wall of Beth Shan. But when the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard what the Philistines had done to Saul, the valiant men, they arose. They went at night, and they took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons to the wall of Beth Shan. And they came to Jabesh, and they burned them there. They took their bones, and they buried them in the tamarisk tree in Jabesh, and they fastened. They fasted for seven days. So the Philistines go to take their spoils. And what David did to Goliath, the Philistines do to Saul. And they praise their gods by parading the dead Saul and his sons. Folks, our war is not just physical. It is very much spiritual. And they didn't view this as just physical. They viewed this as their gods overcame the God of Israel. Our gods won the day. So this is our our next point. All of our battles are spiritual. Even the ones that are mental and in our heads. Because they saw this victory as one over God, not over Saul. So they put his his arm in the temple of Ashtaroth. Right? Why does all this matter? It is so easy for us to say we have a spiritual life and a non-spiritual life. I remember even growing up in private school, we took this survey. Right? We're supposed to take the survey of the secular and the sacred. And I got called in trouble because I marked every single one of them as sacred. Every single one of them. And they're like, no, no, God cannot be in the lottery. I was like, no, but he's a, he cares about the lottery. Right? It was all these statements that said there is no secular. If I'm a Christian, I only have a sacred life. Right? And so here's the difference. Like people view people who are in like full-time ministry as like professional Christians. I've heard that multiple times in my life. But here's the truth. I'm not. Right? I am, I am a pastor. That is my profession. But I would be a Christian whether I was a pastor or not. Right? But here's the truth about all of us. We may not be professional Christians, but God definitely wants you to be a Christian professional. And that calling is just as profound. That's how these Philistines saw this. Their gods have given them victory, so they take the armor to celebrate to their gods Astaroth. Now, this was an ancient deity who had many uh, iterations. It was a very popular deity. You'll see him, the, her sorry, pop up over Israel's history. You see her in Assyrian mythology. She has different names, Astartes, many different things. But she was both the goddess of love and war and a consort to Baal. Becoming an 11th tribe was like, hey, we're having some issues with our brothers, the Benjamites. They're not going where God told them to go, right? God had laid out land for everybody, and the Benjamites didn't go all the way. And because they didn't go all the way, the rest of Israel didn't go all the way. And so the Benjamites start fighting because they don't go to worship God like everybody else. Well, Jabesh Gilead said, we don't want any part of this. We're just going to stop right here. And uh, we'll be neutral. And neither side took that well. But the Benjamites uh, were left off. They were, this, this little town was completely cut off from Israel. It was a moment in Saul's life. It was a redeeming thing he did. They were in trouble from the Philistines, and he came, even though they were supposed to be cut off from Israel. So to return the favor, they hear about Saul. And it says, men of valor, men who put their faith in God, they arose, and they gave them a proper burial. This may only seem like much, but this was a gracious act of God. And we see that reciprocal nature of life. It's not karma, it's not dharma, but it is reaping and sowing. This one thing he did well did aid him and his sons in the end. It didn't save their lives, but it did make a statement. And so we're going to come to a close here. We're actually going to move to 2 Samuel chapter 1. And let's see how David responds to this. So 2 Samuel chapter 1. After the death of Saul, when David had returned from striking down the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. And on the third day, behold, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And he came to David, and he fell on the ground to pay him homage. And David said to him, Where do you come from? And he said, I've escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, Well, how did it go? Tell me. And he answered, The people fled from the battle, and also the people have fallen are dead, and Saul and his son Jonathan are dead. And David said, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? 
And the young man who told him said, By chance I happen to be on Mount Gilboa. And there was Saul leaning on his spear. Behold, the chariots and the horsemen were close upon him. And he, when he looked behind him, he saw me. And he called to me. And I said, Here I am. And he said, Who are you? And I answered him, I'm an Amalekite. And he said to me, Stand behind me and kill me, for anguish has seized me. Yet my life still lingers. So I stood and I killed him. Because I was sure that he cannot live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm, and I brought it to you, my Lord. David took hold of his clothes and he tore them. So did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and they wept and they fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of the Lord, for the house of Israel. So he had fallen by the sword. David said to the young man, Where do you come from? And he said, I'm the son of a sojourner in Amalekite. He says, how is it you were not afraid to put out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? David called the young man and he says, execute him. And he struck him down and he died. And David said, your blood be on your head, for your mouth has testified against you, saying, I kill the Lord's anointed. So we see this part of the story. And this is where we see David being a man after God's own heart. He hears about the death of Saul, his greatest enemy. The one who's tried to kill him multiple times, who's betrayed him, lied to him, taken his wife away, taken his best friend away. Then he got his best friend and closest brother killed. And he punishes the man who claims to take his life. Why? This man lied for clout. Cost him everything. Folks, there's some lies you cannot walk back. He lied. That's not what happened. We know this in the last chapter. But he wanted the clout for, for David. He thought David would rejoice. Right? He would have to rejoice about, about Saul dying. But David was not a wicked man. As the Bible says, God does not rejoice in the death of a wicked man, but desires them to come to repentance. That was the heart of David. He did not delight in the death of Saul. He knew the man Saul could be. And he never stopped believing Saul would be that guy. He knew that he was called of God, so he was God's anointed. And folks, that's why we cannot throw that word or term flippantly. The church cannot just say, well, I'm a pastor or an apostle or whoever, cannot just go out there and exclaim, well, I'm the Lord's anointed. No, 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 no. That had a very specific meaning in this verse. Why We can't just throw those things around. So David weeps, not just over Jonathan, which would make sense, but he weeps over Saul. They fast. And here's point three. This is what loving your enemies looks like. Whew, that's tough. David never dealt anything but kindness to Saul. Ever. He was only ever good to Saul. So picture your worst enemy. I want you to picture that person who's just hurt you left that wound and then I want you to look at David and ask have you loved your enemy like David because ultimately that's loving our enemy like Jesus when Jesus was put and shamed and insulted and crucified he says father forgive them for they know not what they do how do I know I've forgiven my enemy can I rejoice when they rejoice? Can I mourn when they mourn? If I can't, I'm not over it. I am not here to chastise you by not being over it. Because all of us would be like, yeah, if I could just forgive and be healed, I would do it in an instant. It's a process. But that's the gauge. That's how I know. Do I harbor unforgiveness or not? Can I rejoice when they rejoice? Can I mourn when they mourn? Now again, we've talked about this before. We can let go of malice, we can let go of ill will, right? But with Saul, we don't have to keep them close. I don't have to be repeatedly hurt by this person. I can keep them at a distance and rejoice and mourn with them. David knew this. He's like, look, I love you, Saul, but I'm really tired of you throwing spears at me. So you're going to go over there and I'm going to go over here. But David showed he really loved him. So you don't have to let people keep hurting you. But your heart has to be filled with forgiveness. So this was David's emotional posture. I want you just to listen. 
This is the lamentation he gives at the end of the chapter, verses 17 through 27. Just listen. So David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and Jonathan, his son. And he said it should be taught to the people of Judah. So behold, it is written in the book of Jashar. So he said, Your glory, O Israel, is slain on your high places. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Tell it not in Gath. Publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon. Lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice. Lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. O oh, you mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew or rain upon you, nor fields of offering. For there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul, not anointed with oil, but from the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, from the bow of Jonathan turned not back, for the sword of Saul returned not empty. Saul and Jonathan, the beloved and lovely, in life and in death they were not divided, and they were swifter than eagles." They were stronger than lions. Oh, your daughter of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in luxurious and scarlet. You put ornaments of gold on your apparel. Oh, how the mighty have fallen in the midst of battle. Jonathan lies slain on the high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant have you been to me. Your love to me was extraordinary, surpassing the love of women. Oh, how the mighty have fallen, and the weapons of war perished. We all understand him weeping for Jonathan. This was his brother. This was the guy who walked through everything with him. But this is how he wept over Saul. If we want to see a lost world change, this is what we as Christians must be. I'm not saying you don't stand for truth or righteousness. David's about to give recompense. Don't worry, it's coming. Because God brings it. But it wasn't at his pleasure, it was at God's pleasure. We need to see the brokenness in the world and weep. We should desire that. We should not rejoice in the death of the wicked, but our hearts should be to see all come to repentance. It's so easy to build up the good and the bad, the evil, the heroes and the villains. The gospel is really this. We were all villains saved by grace. The gospel is not I was good and became better. I was bad and became good. The gospel is I was dead and now I'm alive. And only Jesus can do this. This is the spirit of the living God pouring through David. Would we weep over the brokenness? Would we stand for truth? Those things can go hand in hand. They're not a false dichotomy. They're not mutually exclusive. Our culture, even in Christian culture, says I can't do both. I can't stand for truth and still weep for those who are perishing. But I must. That's the heart of God. I must stand for truth but not look at them as my enemy, but realize this spiritual battle we are all embroiled in. And realize if this person hurt me, if this person did this, can you imagine the kind of person they are inside? and How much they need a Savior. If this person could be this atrocious publicly, can you imagine what they're feeling inside? I don't think they're sitting there loving themselves every day. Even the most narcissistic person goes home and loathes himself because they realize the effect they've had on those around them. We are all in need of a Savior. And sometimes it takes us standing on truth and saying, hey, this is where we're not going to budge. But what usually helps is when I say, but I hurt for you. And I'm sorry life has been what it's been. But I can change. I want to say, everybody, just bow your heads and close your eyes as we're done. I know this is not the most uh, inspiring or uplifting of messages, but it's the Bible. And we have a strong conviction that even if it's hard or unhappy, we're going to teach the Scriptures. But there's a lot to learn here about God, about ourselves, about leaders. But the thing that hit me is that David had this heart for the wicked man. 
And that's hard to have, folks. That's not easy. I'm not going to pretend like it is. I'm not going to pretend forgiveness is simple. When broached, the disciples, Jesus says, you know, be, you know how would you forgive somebody? Peter says, I'll forgive them seven times because I am so generous and godly. I'll forgive you seven. After that, you're toast. And Jesus says, how about 70 times seven? And none of them would dare retort, oh, so 149. No. The point was I forgive, period. I forgive, period, and I weep for those who are broken. So this morning, I'm going to ask everybody, you know, hey, where are you at with the Lord? Do you feel close to him that the Spirit of God is just speaking through you like David? Do you feel like you're being faithful, but I'm kind of lost in the ether out there? I don't really know who I'm following or where we're going. I'm just going like the people of Israel. Maybe you're Saul. Maybe you're running the complete opposite thing that God has for you. Don't be like Saul and wait till it's too late. These sermons, these hard passages are given so that we can be challenged to change today. That we have the cautionary tale of don't be like Saul. But my call isn't for you to be like David. My call isn't for you to be like me. It calls for you to be like Jesus. And only you know where you're at in that walk. Maybe you're not in that walk at all. If I were to ask you today, if you were to die, would you go to heaven? Do you know where you would go? The scripture says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. But maybe I am a Christian, but I've allowed Jesus to stay on the cross and me on the throne. I would ask that today you would pray with somebody. If you're in any of these categories, or maybe if you're just hurting, maybe you need healing, maybe you're struggling, pray with somebody. We have prayer partners here for a reason. Don't leave here today burdened. Leave here today free. So Jesus, we just come to you as our Savior. One, you would save us from ourselves, from sin and Satan. But help our hearts to be like yours. Help us to run after you, to live like you, to forgive like you, to weep like you, to stand on truth like you. Not as culture, not as ourselves, but you, Jesus, and you alone. Help us to discern what is right and what is wrong. Help us to know who we follow and why we follow them here on earth. Help us to know what it means to be faithful and to worship you. Because, God, you are worthy. We worship you for one reason alone, and it would be enough. There's plenty more. We could list all day your goodness and the things you've done for us. But it starts with, you are worthy, period. You're the only one worthy of worship. So help us to turn our lives and hearts to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So a couple of announcements real quick. Before we wrap up, again, our prayer partners will be here. If you need to pray with somebody, please, please, please do. All right? don't, don't wait to go home. Also, uh, we have missional community starting up. So we have one on Thursday and one on Wednesday. If you want to host, please let us know today. If not, if you would see, if you want to join a group, Thursdays we have the Elder Wootens, right? So we have them there. We have the Torreses on Wednesday. Please, please come. I promise this will be a time of uplifting and fellowship. Amen. All right. Again, if you have any next steps, if you have any next steps, if you want to join the church, if you want to go through baptism, Find out more. If you will go to my brother Josh here, he can help you walk through any of those things. Also, fill out a new member's card. That would be great. If you want to give, you can give in the back. We have a, a thing there. You can give online. However, the Lord leaves on you in your generosity. Also, next Sunday, we have our church-wide fellowship, but it is geared towards our young people. It will be at 4.30 in the Senior Center, and we'll be there till about 7.30, 8 o'clock. And so, again, this is for everybody. So bring your kids, bring your teens. This is a good time of fellowship and for us to get together. Amen. All right. Let's stand and we'll bless and we'll get out of here. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and give you peace. May he be gracious to you. 
Walk knowing that you serve a king who doesn't falter. Pray for wisdom and guidance so you know who you're following and why you follow them, so that you may walk in peace and victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a blessed week, church, and we'll see you on Wednesday.